Hello and welcome to the Legion Symposium, a series where writers, thinkers, and friends imagine a more beautiful future. I'm Luke Ferris, and I'll be guiding our conversation for this episode, which will be how we imagine a beautiful future. Uh, before we delve into the discussion, there's some amazing folks here to talk. Uh, we have Martin, Finn, Thomas, and of course, the mind behind the Legion, L. Griffin. But let's start with some intros. Who am I going to pick? Hmm. Martin, can you start off saying who you are, what you do, and share with our listeners? Sure. Thanks for inviting me. I'm a, a philosopher of science, kind of an intermittent uh, academic. Uh, I'm out of an academic job right now, and I'm part of the Root of, uh, Roots of Progress program with L. And so I'm a little bit all over the place, but uh, one of my main interests is, is progress and uh, energy and how to make a better future. So, yeah. Amazing. And you're an amateur jazz pianist. Is that right? I, I don't think you can be an amateur. If you play jazz, you know, you're know you you're a pro in my book. Yeah, well, it, I, I, have to, I have to be modest. Whenever I listen to real jazz pianists, I, I, I realize that I'm just an amateur. But yeah, I try my best. So my piano is in the background. You probably can't see it. but uh, Amazing. Yeah, Maybe the, we need to score this conversation and we'll, we'll have you yeah. start playing. But anyways, thank you so much. Uh, Who's next? Uh, let's start next with Finn. Introduce yourself. Cool. All right. Well, thank you for having me. Um, I, I guess right now I am a researcher at a nonprofit called Longview Philanthropy. It does uh, philanthropic grant making, especially in AI right now. And then before that, I was also more on the academia side and I was at a place called the Future of Humanity Institute here in Oxford. And yeah, also occasionally right time on this program with um, Alan Martin as well. Amazing. Thanks, Finn. Thomas, you're next. Share yourself, Share a little bit about yourself. Uh, hi, uh, I'm Thomas Puello. i uh, a former tech executive, worked in tech for 15 years. And uh, since uh, the beginning of this year, I'm, I'm working full time on my self tag, which is uh, try to understand all the big trends that influence today. And they're pushing uh, us towards the future. You mentioned energies, that's an example, but others might be psychology, climate, uh, geopolitics, and things like that. Amazing. Thanks, Thomas. And I feel like there's someone else on the call. Oh, yeah. Al, uh, do you want to? I feel like people already <laughs> know who you are. They should know who you are. But if they don't, can you just share who you are? Yes, I'm Al. And um... I am studying utopian thought, uh, which is, you know, everything last 2000 years, every thinker that has imagined a better future, um, as well as what modern thinkers are thinking about how we can make that a reality in our existing future. So um, I'm excited to not be just swarmed in books by myself in my house and to talk to other people about these topics. Fantastic. I'm excited as well. It's going to be a great conversation today. All right, friends, I'm going to start out with a big one. How important is it really to create more imaginative, positive visions of the future? Just a small one and jump in. If, if someone has an answer right away, maybe a one word answer. Well, here's a non-answer, right? You might want to make a distinction here. So you might think that if some culture or some time is producing a bunch of really inspiring visions of the future, then that's at least good news, right? So it's like indicative of something healthy going on. And it's important in that sense because it's like evidence of something else. But then a second thing you might be interested in is the actual causal effects of, you know, inspiring visions of the future. So like maybe in addition to being evidence, these stories, these ideas are actually getting people to become inspired to go and do stuff. That seems like the more interesting question here, and also the harder one because it's really unclear how you might find out. Yeah, I would just say, like, I feel that it's very important just because the predominant worldview, both in nonfiction and fiction, is a doomerist perspective. And I just feel like we're experiencing widespread apathy with just people around the world being like, there's nothing we can do. It's all going to go to hell. We're screwed. Um, and 
I mean, that is crazy to me. And I feel like that is be that is directly reflective of the visions of the future we're currently projecting. And I think part of that is journalism, because the nature of journalism is not to imagine something better. It shouldn't involve imagination at all. Journalism is to report on something that did happen, and problems are the most <laughs> exciting thing to report on and certainly the most lucrative thing to report on. And so I think that in journalism, we have this predominant perspective of, of everything is going wrong. And in fiction, that's also the most exciting thing is to imagine everything going wrong. So I think that any future, any vision somebody can have for the future that's good is definitely highly beneficial and even needed. Well, I, I'll just to piggyback on that. It goes to the the old journalism line, if it bleeds, it reads. And a lot of cinema or storytelling or fiction the more dramatic it is or the more painful it is, a lot of times creates the best stories because it's all about that struggle. I kind of always say if we're writing about these scary things, uh, maybe that means they won't happen. But maybe that I don't know if that's a positive vision. Um, like once we stop writing about them, then that's when I get worried. I don't know what you guys think about that. Yeah, I, I think um, when you talk about the future and I mean, to some extent, everyone has some ideas about how to make how to make a better future how to how to improve the world uh, but then i feel this as ella is saying that many of these people um believe that somehow the future a bright future is one in which we re retreat to an earlier state uh which yeah i mean you could see that as a kind of uh, uh, positive future but it's a kind of positive uh future in which we kind of uh give back to uh, things that we have already accomplished, uh, an earlier like um, society that was living more in harmony with nature. Um, I think it's it's like if you think about the future, it's I, I always think of it as a as a as a continuation of the of the past. Um, so you can think of a world that is even better than today. But I want to be in the same direction. I want to like keep keep going because obviously we're already doing something that is. That is pretty great. Um, I mean, if you look, look at the things that really matter, like like uh, child mortality and extreme poverty and, and, and war and violence, I think we're, we're moving in the right direction. So I think, I mean, I'm, I just I don't want to just extrapolate and say just more of the same stuff, but I just I do want to go forwards. And for many people, even though they would probably say, "Yeah, I'm dreaming of a better future," but then when you ask about the better future, it's like, "Oh yeah, back to where we were like 50, uh, 50 years ago or a hundred years ago." And that doesn't really qualify as a <laughs> as a utopia to me, and and it's, uh, of course I, I don't really believe in this kind of nostalgic vision uh, in, in in the first place. You, you're you talking about the uh, uh, these degrowthers, and, and and I think that's that's a super interesting um, topic here. So a couple of thoughts. Uh, one of them, I, I was studying all the foundation of American cities in the late 19th century and the early 20th century, and what you see is. Like they were very, very thoughtful. They knew exactly what they were doing and they were building and building and building, right? Like they saw uh, um, two rivers crossing each other at some point and they said, okay, here we should have a city, right? And then, and then they go there and they say, okay, we're going to um, build the railroad to here and then from here to here. And they knew exactly where they, what they were doing just by looking at the geography because they could project into the future what was going to happen, right? And then uh, I think First World War, Second World War transforms this mindset of, we can build and we can transform the nature into into in, like shape it into into human thoughts, uh, into oh my god, uh, technology is actually bad. And 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 when you go back then to to the growthers now, uh, I think one of the big reasons why it's very popular is because it's very easy to know to to the problems that we have today and project them into the future, right? We have a problem with CO two today. Or let's project it into the future. What happens? My God, the seas go up and and uh, 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 temperature goes up and whatnot. Uh, whereas when you're doing utop utopian uh, uh, fiction, what you need to imagine is the current problems are solved, and then new problems emerge. So how do you think about these new problems, right? Because one of the reasons why there's no utopian uh, fiction is because, well, if the problems of today are solved, then everybody's happy. So there's no conflict. So there's no story. And so you actually need to figure out new problems. What are the new problems that are going to come up once we solve the current problems? And I think that is a, the key leap in, 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 in thought processing that, that happens and prevents a utopian uh, uh, narrative. Mm -hmm. um, it's been pointed out that, so as a thought experiment, 
suppose that our primate ancestors were asked to describe their idea of utopia, the kind of world that we could build with all of our technology. Well, it seems quite likely that that the world they describe um, would involve unlimited bananas, you know, unlimited trees to swing in, and maybe not much else. Um, <laughs> A faster horse, right? Right, exactly. And presumably that applies to us because um, it's very hard to imagine the problems that will emerge once we solve the problems now. Um, in some sense, once you know those problems, you've kind of already solved the earlier ones. Um, but that just feels like a useful thing to bear in mind that if we're just asked to describe in any detail what you know the really bright futures could look like, um, we shouldn't be so hopeful that we can get the details right, but we should be hopeful that we can at least care about them, at least get some sense of the broad strokes, the kind of scale and the and, and, and that, that's the entire challenge, right? You, you want to create a world that is uh, aspirational, mm -hmm. but if you just create a world that's aspirational, that's boring, right? So, mm -hmm. so you want to do the mix of look at this amazing uh, future, and yet it has all these new problems. And, and I think then, like, how do you come up with these things? I, I, I was uh, watching some uh, Brandon Sanderson lectures a few years ago. Uh, he, he's the author behind um, uh, what, what's the Mistborn. What are what, his books? Like he's super successful. Again, born, missed, born, right? Yes, of course. Born, sorry, yeah, a trilogy exactly. But, and so super, super successful. And, and and he goes on and on about like building uh, uh, his his worlds. And he he takes several late lectures on, on how much he builds it. And so there's so much work on doing it. And yet he barely scratches the surface. And and it, it's he's basically applying existing problems into a different kind of world, but existing problems. And so and so to for you to come up with these new problems, the, the amount of processing that, that you do is 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 a lot, which I think it's okay, how do you go to 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 first principles on what are the things that drive people, right? And and how do these instincts apply differently in a way that's completely in a world that 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 has already solved some of them, right? So for example, one thing they can say is two things that humans will always want are hierarchy and sex, right? And these two things are unsolvable by technology because, by definition, they are uh, uh, they are defined by the scarcity of human other humans, right? And when you hierarchy, you need to be on top of others, and then sex is like you, you even with AI and whatever, you cannot have sex with other. Other, other other humans like it's not the same like there's, there's, there's a limited amount right and so you can imagine a world where okay a lot of the sex is solved with robots with virtual uh, uh um, uh, worlds and things like this but then there's a premium on sex with real people right and same thing for our hierarchy you might have hierarchy in 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 uh, in like in like software hierarchy but then human hierarchy is still valid and so how do you create like how do you use these two scarcities as much more core of the issues in the future, whereas material scarcity is solved. And I think like this is the type of thinking going like down to to, to first principles of the core drivers of humans that, that I think we need to do for for future uh, YouTube narratives. It's interesting because you bring up uh, like a lot of the things we've talked about so far were kind of technology specific futures. And I think that's interesting because with technology, you could imagine that unlimited things could happen. I mean, we could do anything. Um, but one thing that we know for sure is that because, you know, Tomas, you were just talking about um, <laughs> about what all exists, exists hierarchy, um, dictators will probably always exist or will always try to exist. We'll try. I'm not sure that we can like we might be able to with technology do everything, but can we change human nature? I don't know. And so. But mm -hmm. so that, that it's a, yeah, it's interesting what you say, right? Because uh, there's you can imagine a world in a few hundreds or thousands of years where like there's no material scarcity, right? Mm -hmm. uh, um, but then there's also a transitory period in which there is, right? And so then you can imagine near future science fiction where uh, some scarcity is eliminated, but some other is. Like for example, uh, imagine that in 50 years to 100 years, solar, wind, nuclear either fission or fusion solves energy, right? Okay, what are the consequences of this? Well, if you solve energy, you need to think what other scarcities are solved. Actually, food is, is energy, so you solve food. 
right? And so, and, and then you, you solve like a few more issues, transportation is, is solved, like the speed of transportation, things like this. And so then you need to think, okay, you solve energy, then you solve all these other issues. What are the other issues that remain? And, and I think like uh, hierarchy and sex will, all, will always be true, but then there's other scarcities that might still exist. Like for example, I don't know, land, right? It might take some centuries or thousands of years to get more land in, in, uh, in, uh, in other planets. And so how do we figure out what happens in a world where you have plenty of food and entertainment and whatnot, but you don't have uh, enough land? And because you have food and you have energy, we can go to 100 billion humans, no problem. Then it's crowded. So then what is scarce? Well, the beaches, like the beaches, are going to be very <laughs> scarce, right? Very, very scarce. Because there's only so many uh, uh, that you have in the world. It's just a line ar ar around the, the coasts, and there's no more of them, right? So, 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 so you can start thinking of these things where the land issues that we have are going to be dramatically worse in 100 years, maybe not in 1,000, but definitely in 100. And then you can make stories based on this, right? Okay, maybe the issues that we have with Yimbis and Nimbis today are going to be 10 times worse uh, uh, in, in, in 100 years. Whereas uh, maybe the issues that we have with energy and food scarcity are going to disappear. I don't want to live in a world where beaches don't exist because um, I need to go and relax <laughs> on the beach and read a book. So that, yeah. that's a challenging one. Um, I, I want to go back to a, a point Finn, Finn made about this gap. And when we're thinking about imagining a, a brighter future, is the gap of prehistory to now uh, much larger than what we're talking about? Um, is it challenging to be in the now because it feels like there's a we're at a tipping point compared to what Finn said, where the the prehistory cave people were just hoping for maybe a faster horse or bananas. Um, Martin, do you want to jump in on that question? What do you what do you think about that gap when we're thinking about a, a brighter yeah, future? I was um, thinking of this um, this fantasy um, the, that many people had uh, in, in the Middle Ages uh, about uh, the, the land of cocaine. Um, I'm not sure if you've heard of it. It has a different name in Dutch, but it was this, this, yeah, this land of of abundance and and um, and and cornucopia, where like the the the, the roasted geese would just fly in your mouth, and there would be pancakes growing on the trees and stuff like that. And and of course, in a way, we we kind of realize that because that's that's really what a supermarket is. Like if you were to you know uh, transport somebody from the Middle Ages in a time machine, he would be like he would be. Uh, imagining that he arrived in the, la the land of cocaine, but then I, I guess that there, there's also plenty of other things that um, didn't even occur to someone in living in the Middle Ages because it was so far out of like the ordinary. Even something that I'm going to try to take a mundane example, like like a, a fridge, just the idea that you can produce artificial ice and you can just keep food. Fresh. I mean, perhaps the, so someone in the Middle Ages would have thought like, oh, perhaps the food just does, doesn't doesn't rot or just does, does, doesn't go bad. But just the idea that you can have an artificial device that just creates ice and keeps the food cool. There's probably plenty plenty of stuff like that. I guess flying would be because it's like you just extrapolate. Oh, we, we, we want to do whatever the birds are doing. So that's that's kind of easy. But I, I guess they're so, you know, thinking of our uh, vantage point. When I was just l l listing things like child mortality and extreme poverty and and like an, an abundant energy, I mean, all of these are kind of conservative and modest in the sense that oh yeah, it's just more of the same stuff. It's mm -hmm. it's like along the same continuum, but but a little bit uh, farther. But then there's these other things that that are un inherently unpredictable, and that it's and th that's a really thing. Um, the, the tricky bit also when when, when Thomas was mentioning uh, the 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 hierarchy and and, and status, for example. I mean, I'm not actually so sure that we can always assume that th these things will, will always be there. Or, for example, um, either that we could change human nature. For example, I mean, we could just switch off <laughs> this this kind of a, a you know character trait or, or just this uh, this part of human nature that we don't like because it, you know it's a non-rival good and it leads to all these uh, uh, forms of conflict. But then, on the other hand, I mean, I'm just uh, thinking out loud now, but. For example, for aspiring dictators, like the people who really want to rule the world, perhaps they can have like experience machines, like, you know, uh, Robert Nozick is this philosopher who came up with experience machine, where everything looks exactly real and it's a perfect simulation. Like if you really want to be Hitler or Stalin, like <laughs> rather than actually conquer the world, we just put you in an experience machine and you can have everything that you desire. Um, mm -hmm. 
anyway, so I'm just I'm just saying that there's probably stuff that from our like with our feeble imagination that we cannot even wrap our heads around because it's yeah because it's so far it's so far removed from everything and everything that we're familiar with. I remember the earlier conversation we had, which I think led to this conversation, Alan Martin. We were talking about how hard it must be to figure out what the world would look like in a thousand years, and you're saying things like you know, maybe we'll we'll have evolved like fins to swim or whatever, and we'll have hoverboards and so on. And um, I think I noticed I was surprised to hear that maybe I'm getting this wrong, um, but I got the impression that in your kind of distribution over the future in a thousand years, most of the worlds still had most people being biological humans still on Earth, where to me it seems quite plausible that in that kind of time scale, either there just won't be people or most people will um, be digital rather than biological. And that's, to, you know, like, who knows, right? But I think that's quite a nice example of just yeah. realizing like, oh, we're missing this, this um, parameter, which could just be like totally different. This is why the best movie of all time is Everything Everywhere All at Once, because mm -hmm. it's never seen mm -hmm. more imaginative ways that life could go. <laughs> right. Mm -hmm. All the way down to like the apes with the longer fingers win this rock fight and everybody's got these long hands. Or just the the in, 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 the, the the actual rocks, like yeah. just that even that that uh, that's been the, a, had the last year and a half, where it's just we're just rocks talking to each other, and that like it gives me a lot of peace, which is interesting. Yeah. Like it helps me through the day to day. It comes up in my brain like every week. I, 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 you, go ahead. Right. No, no. Oh, I was just gonna say I love like just even the thought of. Um, you know, I saw a comedian recently who was like, I'm 44 years old. I'm so old. Like the things that I remember are like a chimp in a ring fighting people like you would pay at the county fair to pay to fight a, a chimpanzee in a ring. And he's like, that would never be allowed today. And he's like, and there's people even older than me that remember like that they were deaf until they were nine and nobody realized it until they were nine. And you're just like, well, that's crazy because that's only in a 100 year span. So we're going to see even within our lifetimes, by the time we're all a hundred, we're going to be like, oh my God, things are so crazy and things are so different. And mm -hmm. we could already see that in so many writers. I mean, William Morris was imagining the year 2000 when he, in 1890, when he wrote News from Nowhere and everybody's riding horse and carriages, even though uh, they were only like five years away from the invention of the car at the time he wrote that. So like he couldn't even see you know, the Jetsons yeah. were in the 60s, they had flying cars, but they didn't have cell phones or anything. So it's like, we, like, what are we not seeing that could be just around the corner, even just 10 years from now, that even in our ex like extrapolated imagination, we're like, oh, AI will do this. And AI, like, obviously we'll use AI for that or whatever. But 10 years from now, we're like, oh, it's not even AI, it's something else. What's well, the gap between the first Wright Brothers flight and literally landing on the moon? <laughs> Yeah, six years. I think yeah, it's 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 within the lifespan Wild. Of, of a human being. Yeah. I also like one e extreme example of that because now we're really talking about the distant future. Like uh, for a very long time, I believe that like the the absolute deadline of humanity or of the of, of just life on Earth would be what is it like five billion years into the future, and then the sun will will expand and just swallow up the earth. And I was like, yeah, there's no way around that. There's just no way that we're going to avoid that because the sun is going to, I mean, and then I think it was David Deutsch, uh, after reading David Deutsch, I was like, hang on, no, that's not true at all. I mean, if we start geoengineering, if we just have technological solutions mm -hmm. that screen um, some of the solar ra radiation, I mean, there's no, there's no reason why we just would have to just meekly and passively uh, suffer this 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 solar expansion i mean we, perhaps you can even change the sun or just refuel it or whatever i mean there's so many different possibilities and i keep like uh catching myself like making these kinds of conservative assumptions about everything even though i i was trying to avoid them like I, when i was replying to thomas i said oh perhaps we can change human nature but then finn was kind of like <laughs> like uh, uh taking the next next step and saying like why would we even have humans in the first place i mean it's like yeah you could have just artificial intelligence human nature could be just a relic in a museum or something like that and it's very hard to avoid that that it, perhaps even mm -hmm. finn is making some conservative assumption that <laughs> he doesn't even realize that he smuggled in um unless you're going to say something to my it looks like you're yeah one thing i was going to mention is um 
like here's one kind of gloss that you can put on like human history that's like obviously oversimplifying but i find that it's a useful frame sometimes um so robin hansen talks about this like if you really squint at history one thing you might see is like uh it looks like we kind of went through a series of growth modes so most of human history we're all just hunter gatherers right and growth was like effectively flat like human population basically didn't notably change um and then like farming happened and it happened uh, interestingly like um at lots of different points in the world in like an unconnected way but roughly the same time about ten thousand years ago and then you got like city states and you got like some amount of growth but like maybe sub percent per year um and then the industrial revolution happened and you got like on the order of five percent per year growth up to now and if you're like just really naively extrapolating, then you might think, well, okay, we have this like series of growth modes and they're all increasing one after the other. What if now you, you get like double digit percentage growth? Maybe because you can automate R&D, maybe because humans are no longer a bottleneck doing R&D. So, okay, like let's say 20% uh, growth or something. What kind of um, multiple on today's economy does that get you after a century? It's not like, oh, the world's going to be like 50 times richer. It's like 80 million times richer. And I think that's like, obviously, completely stupid and naive to use that as any kind of concrete prediction. But just noticing that, um, that you get that kind of growth over a century, which doesn't feel too long, that feels like a useful kind of intuition pump for me. You know, like things could be maybe very different, maybe quite soon. So it's interesting because I think we're actually talking here about boundaries that we, we should be putting on, on this imagination of the future. So one of them uh, that you're mentioning, Finn, is, is is AI and after the singularity, like we just don't know. And and, and the, the singularity, if you agree with uh, Ray Kurzweil, it's not that far away, right? Or even with uh, Metaculus, it's like it's like 20 yeah. to 30 years. And so so that, that that's I think that's a very good argument for either dropping AI as a as a fiction uh, boundary, or or uh, doing um, near future uh, uh, fiction, uh, but you you bringing this other thing. I was doing I was reading the, about this calculation um, on on what's the potential that the future has for growth, and just looking at atoms, right, and things mm -hmm. like this, and mm -hmm. the energy amount that the Earth can 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 process. Like we don't have that much growth in front of us. Like we might have mm -hmm. hundred. Uh, years to like 2000 uh at a high peak growth but that's it right? otherwise you consume all of the energy of the of the sun and then some uh and and, and mm -hmm. you cannot uh and, and may maybe you can create more energy with fusion but you cannot uh get the energy out right so mm -hmm. I, then you have a problem where it's just like the the, the earth is, is warming up and so like physically there's physical limits to this type of of uh of, of scenario yeah i might get this wrong but um something like if you are growing at 2%, which is conservative per year for 8,000 years, which is like maybe roughly how long modern civilization has been going on, then you would need to sustain an Earth-sized economy per atom in the observable universe to sustain that amount of growth. And yeah. well, yeah, one thing that shows, which is like a really good point, is that um, this period of growth is like, just can't go on. It's like very special. Like this is very cool that we're living through this. But then you hear the growthers say, they, they hear this argument, they don't really understand it. And oh, yeah, say, it's got nothing oh, to do with the and growth. Energy cannot go forever. Even we, like, for anything that's practical for us, we, it can go forever. We've got a few more billion. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Ahead. Unless we figure out the aging, uh, how to eliminate aging, and then, and, then, and then we have a problem. Right. I think we will. Yeah. That's right. They keep getting stuck on this, like, almost just mathematical truism, like, nothing can grow forever on a finite planet or even a finite universe. Yeah, sure. I mean, <laughs> perhaps in a couple of thousands of years, but it's not like, it's not of our concern right now if we're talking about like our energy needs in the future. Uh, and, and I think, so uh, interesting uh, uh, new point here on this. One of the debates that I think I was into, but I think I'm less into now is is about fertility, right? You, you hear the two sides now being extremely polarized about fertility, like one side of the growth is now we need to stop having babies and we're just talking about the problem. But the, there's the other problem of, oh my God, we're not having enough babies. And uh, and I think, and I was worried about it, this too, but then, then I thought about it a bit more and I'm like, wait, hold on, it's going to take us many decades, probably centuries for this to be really problematic. 
And A, there's going to be AI singularity in the meantime, so who cares? And then B, you have all, even if you don't have AI, the singularity, you have other things like uh, in the artificial wombs and things like this, right? Le uh, like AI tutors, right? And so you can go through the list of all the reasons why people are not having babies today because they do want to have more babies. Everybody wants to have more babies. They just can't. And there's a million reasons, right? I cannot educate my children. I can, like the childcare is too expensive. It's too hard. Like I cannot feed them properly. I cannot, uh, uh, like, I, I don't want to have them in my body. I don't want to push them out, right? So all these problems, one by one, you can actually uh, uh, solve them in the next few decades. And so it's like, mm, you shouldn't be worrying about fertility too much right now, I think. And, mm. and Thomas, isn't that a, the challenge where like even a year ago, the status quo of the now influences so much of how we talk about the future. Like this week influences how how we we talk about the future. Why is it so challenging for us to to have these conversations? Because I feel like we have to fight against that. Because in a year, so many things could change. How how do and this is to everyone. How do we like change that? Can we not change that? But why is it so hard? Here's one hypothesis, and you guys like tell me what you think. Uh, I'm I'm I am very much a generalist. And it takes, like, I get so much shit for being a generalist. Like, it's like, Ugh. Can you Can you define generalist for, for yeah, yeah, yeah. The, the, so, the lay folks out there? So first, so first, uh, when I, 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 I went viral with COVID, right? And so, like, what people were like, oh, like, you, who are you? You don't know anything about COVID. Uh, you, you, Next you time I get infected with COVID, I'm going to say I got true. viral with COVID. I don't know a lot about it. Then you can put numbers. Second, Thomas, we lost you a little bit. So yeah, sorry, I froze. So so you have the, yeah, yeah, I froze. So very very quickly, um, yeah, my connection is unstable. Very quickly, uh, going back. So I first uh, went uh, viral with COVID, and everybody was like, oh, you don't know anything about COVID. You don't have any credentials, and that is true. Uh, and then and then after that, I went viral in geopolitics. It's like, oh, the COVID guy <laughs> is <laughs> doing geopolitics. Oh, now I'm the COVID guy. And then I'll do something else. It's like, oh, the geopolitics guy is doing sex. It's like, so I get so, so much shit. Everybody is stay on the, saying, stay on, the, on your lane. And, and you end up having like this huge pressure of everybody saying, you have to be expert in your own thing. Your you niche, cannot be a generalist, yeah. right? And, and you need to be a generalist for you to predict the future because you have all of these uh, uh, big trends in all these different and disciplines that if you don't understand how they interact with each other, it is impossible for you to predict the future. And so the overlap of people who have a good enough understanding of all these fields is so little that if you on top of that have to, to, to overlay the percentage of those who want to create, to write future uh, uh, fiction, then it's just zero. One, L. <laughs> <laughs> Right. Yeah. No, I'm a generalist too. And I, I agree. You have That's to right. have that wide scope to be able to see all the different things, the, the ways that they could in, interact. And I, I mean, I can't, I can't imagine it. I mean, even a lot of the things you guys have said today, I'm like, I've never thought about that before. I'm going to go Google that after this. <laughs> El, can, I, can I ask you a question? Yeah. So like, we're talking about fiction, right? And mm. you might look to sci-fi because that just feels like the most relevant genre for imagining the future. And people talk about this sci-fi golden age, right? So like Patsy Clark and Heinlein and Stapledon and yeah. Asimov. Um, and then like that golden age was like 50 plus years ago. And at least there's a sense that maybe there is less super imaginative sci-fi really rising to like the level of like mass cultural awareness. Does that seem right? And if so, what's going on there? Or is it just, you know, like selection? Once we have enough time, we find the best stuff from the past. Yeah, now the old popular ones from the past are just becoming episodes, episodics on HBO. Right. <laughs> <laughs> so we're just bringing it back in television form. Um, I, I do think that there was a period in like the 50s and 60s that was a golden age for sci-fi for sure. And, it, and that was like the era of Disneyland's Tomorrowland where it was like we were going to space and so everyone was just like imagining space colonies and, and everything. And I think that makes sense. I think now we're just in the age of, uh, I, I don't know, AI, AI, AI dystopia, The Handmaid's Tale, um, you know, these kind of like episodic mm. dystopians. But yeah, I don't think it's as popular. I don't think mm -hmm. fiction is as popular. I mean, 
Mm-hmm. One other thing that happened since then is like just, you know, TV and cell phones happened. So we have other ways that we get media and nobody's like really relying on the books as much. Yeah, it was also a golden age of of narrative fiction as well. Uh, it was right at the crossroads before film and television changed, color television and uh, it into the 70s. Color, well, when we did color television, but yeah, no, you're right. Yeah, it was before color television. So yeah, it was, yeah, a lot's changed since then. And mm-hmm. This reminds me of another of these debates that I'm, I'm laying out all my pet peeves here. Uh, 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 Lay it all these, out, the, Thomas. Lay it yeah, all yeah, out. Yeah, 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 yeah. These are all that. Like each one of these is a, is, is a, a draft in my <laughs> in my infinite pile. Um, there's no more geniuses. Where are the geniuses? And then and then they take uh, um, a graph of the genius writers and like. Yeah, of course, there's fewer genius writers because of the Lindy effect. And, and then, like, if you're the first Shakespeare, then everybody's going to remember you. And then it's very hard to innovate as much. And right? so, yeah, of course, there's going to be fewer uh, Shakespeare's. I think what's this missing, like, what this is missing is uh, the fields. Like, yeah, if you look at physics, also, there's going to be fewer mm, discoveries in physics because we've been at this for like a couple of centuries. And most of them were in the 19th century and the beginning of the 20th century. And now it's really freaking hard. So if you only look at physics, yeah, there's no more geniuses. But just don't look at physics. Like just look at other other uh, uh, fields, right? And so if you start looking at the new fields, then everything changes. Like for example, I would argue that the fiction in The Last of Us, uh, for me, has been more touching than nearly any other book that I've uh, that I've read, right? Uh, uh, because you're there and you're feeling this thing. And you don't want to do this, but they force you to play this character doing these things. And you hate it and you hate yourself in a way that you can't if you're only watching it. And so I feel like things like The Last of Us or, or, or video games like this are innovating in a way that is, is unbelievable. And so if you take these new fields, then you have these geniuses, right? And I'm sure in 100 years, somebody's going to say, oh, we don't have more geniuses because look in video games everything was invited invented in the in the golden age of the 2000s and the 2020s yeah. it's a great point because uh, video games are also a medium that is uh, has the ability to be long form they can be short form video games but right. really in depth and immersive experiences like reading um beyond where a screen and getting a story as much as i love it uh it's it's a it's not really a two-way conversation you're not That's really right. putting yourself in the character or the situation's shoes um and, and so there's so much invention that can be done there right and so you can trans so that's true for 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 art but then obviously it's also true for for the industry yeah you're not going to find a lot of physics geniuses but we have satoshi nakamoto right like oh my god like freaking crazy where did you pull these off we have the people who who write the transformers papers that create friends freaking like freaking agi this is what well, llms are basically <clears throat> agi like in like or it may be narrow ai but they, they're, they're close to it and now it's like oh it's normal um two, two months later oh yeah yeah this is normal like this is freaking crazy and in a hundred years when they're going to look back at these papers and like oh my god these were geniuses we don't have these more geniuses anymore oh come on mm. yeah, that, that actually be- also ties in with this this uh um, nostalgia for the for the past and just the glorification of just all the the people who went before us. Like this, I think it this is quote by it's, it's either Thomas Hobbes or David Hume. Like uh, that man. Like um, we tend to glorify uh, past geniuses because man compete with the the living and, and not with the dead. So it's kind of easy to say like, oh no, we're never gonna achieve like the perfection of Bach or or Mozart or even it's even offensive to compare any physicist to Isaac Newton because it's like, oh, these were the greats. And yeah, I guess you're right, Thomas. Like in in a hundred years, I mean, <laughs> they're gonna say exactly the same thing about us. Like we live in the like we're only yeah not standing on the shoulders of the giants. Like we're just so small and, and insignificant compared to all these these greats that when like even like in in in, in music for example uh you you see this 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 canonization is that is that the word like it's just a in in jazz for example it had in, in, in the span of a couple of decades and now like john coltrane and miles davis and these are like the legendary names like the, the real geniuses of the past and like you cannot compare any like uh uh musician living today to any of these you know real geniuses there's always like a i guess a tendency to to think that uh yeah that that we're that that 
that that, that, that we don't compare very well to the to the past to uh, accomplishments of the past. How does that, as all thinkers, writers here, how do you individually deal with that fact of you're trying to produce and think and, and do things and do your work, but you're in the midst of, you're competing with the nostalgia of the past and the in, insanity and the fast paced of today. How do you all wrestle with that when you're you know, having your tea and coffee in the morning and trying to do your work? I mean, I think all the time about how I'm in the wrong field and like how I like, even if you're, even if you look 20, I mean, what is it? 20 million, is it 20 million people on Substack or whatever? Um, even if you look at that, that is still seems really small compared to the amount of people who watch a TV or play a video game or, um, you know, do like are participating in other mediums. And I always wonder like, okay, sure, maybe Substack is the next evolution of writing. It's maybe how we're disseminating ideas today, um, but in written form. But is that really how we're disseminating information? Like what what will be in the future how we how we have these thoughts and share them with each other? Like it seems even what we're doing now just feels like it's gonna be outmoded so fast. It's eliciting a couple of thoughts, and you guys cut me whenever you want. Um, <laughs> see, otherwise I'm gonna keep going. Uh, um, uh, so, so uh, maybe three three thoughts. One, um, I struggle a lot because people want newsworthiness. They want things that are highly relevant today, but what's relevant today is not what's really really important. Right? And so there's a there's I think that's the first thing: the balance between uh, what's really important versus what's uh, um, uh, urgent, and people preferring the urgent to the important. Um, you mentioned the new new uh, other media, uh, Ellen. I think you're very right. Especially right now, short vertical video uh, is huge uh, across you know YouTube and Instagram and TikTok. Huge, huge, huge. If you want to reach, if you want to. You, that's what you need to do. Right? And so uh, uh, th there's a big question of like, okay, writing. Do you do that because you want it, or because it's the thing that you're good at? Um, or because it helps you think, right? And if this is the, if it's the latter, then okay, like how much should you should you spend on thinking versus then doing for other media, uh, and mm -hmm. and as a result, how much you should uh, ex become an expert in video, right? Which is the problem that you were discussing at the beginning of the hour of oh, I cannot do video well and so on and so forth. And I think the, the, the third the third thought is uh, what is the next uh, medium that that comes, right? And uh, people talk about virtual reality, and I think to me. The, 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 there's another one where uh, I go, it does very orthogonal, but I, I, this is the one that I keep thinking about all the time, which is collaborative uh, uh, content making, right? And so maybe not for fiction, but for nonfiction, absolutely. Uh, uh, each time that I write an article, I can be studying it for 50 hours and then I publish it. And then within minutes, I have a hundred improvements that could be made, right? It's like, I don't want to spend 50 hours writing this article. I just want to like spend like 20 minutes, put it out there, and then we build it together, right? And so this is the type of of, of collaborative uh, uh, content building that I think is going to come that I'm excited about. That is so true because you learn so much in the comments. Sometimes I feel like I should just put forward my hypothesis without right. my research behind it and just say, this is mm. my hypothesis. You guys all have like right. your own niche knowledge points like bring them to the table and finish the story <laughs> and so and so I, th I think we're in this in this moment right and where wh what is like what is substack it's just like you grab the essay like on paper the paper essay and then you put it in an internet the same way as at the beginning of cinema you, you take the theater and you plug it in front of a camera right? but then somebody starts like reinventing cinema right based on the camera camera angles and zoom in and blah blah not and so okay what does the essay look like in an internet world and it definitely isn't uh, a blog post. It is definitely not a news, new, new, newspaper article. It is something else. And I think the collaboration aspect of it is has to be the future of, of the written medium. You know what? I think it's Cunningham's law. It's like the best way to be to get the right answer on the internet is to post the wrong answer on the internet. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> What's it? So true. And I hate that that just invalidates <laughs> all your research. So then you're just like, I wish I didn't research that. <laughs> right. I can say with confidence, it does matter that you put 
work into the essays L specifically is that I'm a, I'm a subscriber. It does matter. Uh, I think you all were, are in the work, but I think people really value to sit with ideas and re reading and writing is still the best way to do that. Um, you're not going to probably, I, I haven't learned a lot from TikTok uh, videos. I've laughed a lot at silly videos, but I haven't really been able to sit down and have in-depth understanding, which I think reading and writing allows you to do. Um, in a world of distractions, we need moments, whether it's a physical book, whether it's reading your Substack app, to sit down and marinate in an idea. Yeah, one side note here, I don't know if this is relevant, but it's this weird situation where most academics, at least a median academic, is really functionally writing for an audience of like, I don't know, 20 people. How many people are actually reading, you know, theses or papers in some sub subfield? Um, but these people have like deep knowledge in some important niche. And if, I don't know if you guys have just like found some academic and emailed them and asked if they could like chat because you're interested. They're like so happy to get that email so much of the time. Um, it feels a bit unstable. Like it feels like maybe there's more opportunity to just tap all this like knowledge that currently gets put on some um, some journal and read by like 12 people. Maybe your advisor reads half of it and gets bored. We need to change ac academic writing. I do not get why we still make that the format. I mean, even when I was doing my graduate studies, like I the way that I had to format my writing to make it applicable to an academic audience that would never read it was so <laughs> that I was like, nobody will ever read this. So then I had to like, I would write it for school and then I would deconstruct the whole thing and make it like make a version that was palatable for the internet and post it as mm. a blog or whatever. But like, mm. that's silly. Why can't you just make it publishable from the very beginning? Like we should change that. Mm. It's gonna work. So the philosophy is even a, no, go ahead. No, in philosophy, it's even worse in 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 the in that like if 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 your writing is accessible and 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 a lay audience can can understand it, oh, then it's not real philosophy. It has to be, you know, obscure with a lot of uh, like uh, pedantic uh, jargon and and because otherwise you're just throwing pearls to the swines. So, like it's a really like I'm, I'm teaching still the, the to philosophy students and. Uh, it's not, nothing is easier than making things complicated and all of them are doing it because they're so intellectually insecure and they want to, they, they only want to write for these, these 20 people who are specialists because they want to, you know, otherwise <laughs> they're selling out or whatever. Like, anyway, this is just a pet peeve of mine, Thomas. No, no, I'm, I'm, I'm thinking you're making, you guys are making you think, uh, and uh, your background is philosophy. My, my background is, is, um, text targets, right. And, and, uh, when, uh, Luke, you mentioned the, um, the fact that you appreciate uh, Al's uh, articles, my my mind immediately went to, well, would you appreciate them better if instead of spending 50 hours per article uh, on just thinking and then publishing it, she spent 50 hours, but with 10 iterations, right? Where five hours, she puts it out, feedback, and then she has iteration cycles, right? And so, and so uh, uh, like all this uh, information iteration is a lot of what um, startup uh, design is about right. Why are like startups more more productive? Because you have a vast fast feedback loop in, in information between only a few people. They're fast decision makers. You don't need to make uh, to to involve anybody else, uh, right? And so and so these these iterations cycle. So I think it, it changes the question around what is the scarce resource? And the, the scarce resource for the for the content producer is the is the time to spend on it. But then and then for the consumers, there's the time of, the, the time of consuming. But then there's you have you have these other group of people who I think is discounted, which is the ones who participate, right? And that is an untapped resource. You have a lot of people who would be willing to spend a bit more time than just consuming and iterating with the creator. And so that I think is, is the piece where, okay, can we change completely the way that essays are written or content is made where you involve these people who are willing to put their resources, but you need an infrastructure to enable this input uh, to, 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 to be put in and then, and then the iterations to, to happen fast. And I'm sure the essays that would come out of that would be 10 times better than they are today. I love that idea so much. Almost like, okay, we're all going to write a Wikipedia page together. Here's the topic. Everybody bring your expertise and like, let's all edit it together and 
and like compose it. That would be super fascinating. And, and so that's interesting. I, I love these, these comparisons because like if you take then the, 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 the startup, right? So if you do that with two people, it works, right? Because they can uh, 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 riff off of each other. But if you have a thousand people, it doesn't work at all, right? And actually mm-hmm. you need a massive vision at the top. Right? And you need to be very, very clever on how you create the culture, blah, 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 blah. And so, and so, I think this is the equivalent here, where if you're a writer, uh, a writer, uh, you have this holacracy, right? Where they have one person, like you need, you do need a person at the top laying out the vision, and the, and the theme is not enough because people cannot really interact. You need to lay out the vision, and they need to lay out the interaction dynamics between all of them, which is the culture, so that everybody needs how to inter- like knows how to interact with it. And so, and so, it, it is, it is not a, is not a, a, a standard thing. But if you think about it, like what we're talking about right now is not something that exists at all. It's something that will be existing in 20 years. And then back to the genius genius thing, like in 50 years, somebody is going to say, oh my God, the people who invited this thing are amazing. And, and they were so, 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 so amazing geniuses. When in fact, we have these things in front of us that we could be creating. I feel like you I guys want to... Go ahead, Finn. Sorry, I just wanted to raise like maybe a gentle counterpoint or something, or at least express that I'm, I'm confused about this. So maybe one question here is, it seems like we already have the tools to write collaborative books and posts and so on. And if they are much better, then there's at least a question of why they don't already exist, right? Because surely they just do very well. And then another thing that came to mind is maybe kind of random, but Wikipedia sounds like a great example, right? Because it it's this kind of miraculous collaborative online document. And somehow it still it, it works. Like anyone can edit it and it's not a steaming garbage pile. Um but Martin, you'll you'll um know this. Philosophy, at least academic philosophy, has its own like mini Wikipedia called the Stanford Encyclopedia of Philosophy. And it's mm-hmm. always like the go-to website before you go to the Wikipedia page for the philosophy thing. And um, the model that they have is rather than having collaborative pages, they just have editors. The editors will say, who's the person to go to on this like random yeah. topic? And then they'll get them to write the, the thing. They'll edit it like they're editing a book, but it's a single author. And the average quality seems to be higher in my impression and that feels at least suggestive anyway that's my gentle pushback <laughs> yeah is, is that i, I think there, there are two themes in, in what has been discussed uh, in the past couple of minutes here you have the collaborative aspect uh of of writing and um exchanging ideas and, and riffing off on each other's ideas etc but then there's also like at the the, the question at, at what moment do you release your ideas into the wilds and and you know uh and welcome feedback and I guess, like, I have some hesitation uh, about putting out some half-baked ideas out there because I'm always embarrassed when I say something wrong. And I guess, in this, like, um, for psychological reasons, it also makes sense that once you have publicly committed to a view, and then it turns out that it made an embarrassing error. Then of course it's a completely different situation from like somebody who comments on a draft that you wrote and that actually and points out the error and then of course he, and he <laughs> protects you from just embarrassing yourself. Um, so should we be more like less embarrassed about uh, making errors just uh, and and putting them out there and and see uh, yeah and then perhaps they will be corrected more quickly. And I'm not sure. It's a, but but I de- definitely I have I can. Think of multiple occasions in which I was like relieved that oh, luckily somebody <laughs> pointed out this error because I was about to publish it and I would have made a fool of myself. And now, like, it's so hard to admit, you know, having been wrong about something, especially mm. if, if you, because if you present something out there publicly, it, it's it has a certain permanence to it. It's like you stake your reputation to the thing that you've written. Like, I stand I stand behind this, and if yeah, if, if then it turns out to be completely wrong, then. Yeah. Can, can, there was this example that we mentioned from was it Nomi Klein who was uh, like confronted during a radio? Uh, no, it was Nomi Wolf, right? I mean, there's Nomi Klein and Nomi Wolf. She was confronted during a radio interview about like a really embarrassing error that she made about just mis- mistranslating a historical document. Um, and that's like the worst nightmare, I guess, that every writer can have that you publish a book and then it turns out to be, oh no, I made this huge, like glaring error. Like, I'm <laughs> so I, shameful. I, I, I don't know. My personal feel is like, I'm totally okay with putting something out that's wrong. And in fact, I feel like that's almost the rule and not the exception. If I'm even going to look back at my work 10 years ago, you know, yeah. I do think I've been talking with somebody online about Plato's Republic and we've been like parsing through it. And um, it is so funny, our different takes on it, uh, because um, 
there's this huge argument of like, oh, we've read every single thing Plato read and some of these things contradict each other. So what did he even think? And all, you know, Socrates is the main character in all of these. And and how much of this is his philosophy versus Plato's and, and all this stuff we can't ever really know. And then I started thinking about this and I was like, me and this guy are debating about this on the internet, what he could have possibly meant by this book based on all the other books he wrote and everything. And I'm like, oh my God, what if somebody read all of my work and then tried to explain <laughs> what yeah. I thought about things? Then yeah. they would totally get me so wrong because I have written about so many wild ideas. And to me, the point is just like, put the wild idea out there so that we can like think about it. And I don't like care if it's right or not. It's just like an idea. And and it could be, I could I could write the exact opposite thing in two years. Like, <laughs> I don't know. Yeah, yeah. And, and that's that's what this symposium is about, friends. Uh, t- to bring it back, uh, we're 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 getting close on time. I I feel I felt like this was going to be a problem where we could talk for four hours, but we're not going to. Um, I want to wrap up with some takeaways for our listeners, viewers. What's your favorite science fiction imagining of the future? So shout out some recommendations. I know we've dropped a few here in the conversation, but you know, for someone to take away, or someone that was trying to delve into more science fiction imagining of the future what would you recommend i still think everything everywhere all at once is the most imaginative looking at my goodreads well yeah i'm also get up your goodreads get your letterbox get it all the lists yeah so i'm 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 a a big fan of uh, andy weir right uh Mm -hmm. uh, the martian uh i just read a, a few weeks ago uh uh hail mary project hail mary and what I love, what he does is he really, really, really understands deeply, right, all the physics. And then he changes, he has one small premise, change. And what if this thing happens, right? Uh, uh, in the case of Project Hail Mary, I'm not going like, to change like, anything for you, but uh, he's imagining it as well, where you, you, you meet aliens that are actually not that advanced. But they're very physically different, right? So what this could look like, and then he builds everything else around this premise, um, and, and I think that works really, really well, um, because going back to what we said at the beginning, um, he, he, the world build, building is is, is unbelievably uh, deep. He go he understands the physics, he understands all the ramifications of all the physics that need to happen. He only changes one thing, and then he can he can. Uh, uh, follow all the ramifications through, uh, and I think that's what gives uh, the, the, his fiction so much uh, richness. I was thinking of examples, and I just realized that all of them are not especially positive. Yeah, <laughs> kind of which goes back to uh, this beginning of the conversation, um, right? The thing I was, that came to mind first was this very strange book called *The Age of M*. Robin Hanson wrote. He's an economist. He's like noticeably not a fiction writer, but he's just trying to. Try to imagine with his like very economist mind um, what a world of digital minds could look like where they're running very fast or like emulations of human minds. They're trading with one another. Um, it's like super weird, but like such a cool exercise in like actually seriously trying to imagine what some outcome could look like. Uh, and then also other things that came to mind. Olaf Stapledon, Star Maker, but like sheer scale is awesome. Greg Egan as well as great. The culture series, uh, also three body problem. I love that. It was really fun. Martin, what about you? Yeah, I, I have to admit, I don't read a lot of uh, science fiction, but I, I'm going to mention a book that that Al and I were uh, uh, talking about recently. Although I can't really recommend it, but it's the last science fiction novel that I read. It's uh, Ministry for the Future by uh, Kim Stanley Robinson. And so, even though there's some parts of it that I think. Um, I like and I approve of like the can-do mentality um, and that he uh, the fact that he takes geoengineering seriously, uh, unlike many other uh, climate activists, like spraying water on uh, glaciers and, and ice caps in, in Antarctica. But then on the other hand, there's the <laughs> there's the kind of anti-capitalist, anti-modernity, uh, uh, you know, uh, anti-neoliberalism stuff. Where it feels like okay, even though the it's it's an optimistic novel in the sense that it has a you know a happy ending and and all 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 ends well after a couple of million people die because of heat waves etc. But but the bright future is like the, the, the thing I mentioned in the beginning. It's like reverting it's to something that we had earlier, like all just undoing all the all the 
you know, alleged mistakes that we make by just, you know, being obsessed with economic growth, etc. So, um, yeah, I'm just going <laughs> to read all the books that you recommended because obviously I've been <laughs> reading the wrong science fiction. <laughs> <laughs> Amazing. Uh, Thomas, where can we find your work? Where can people find your work? Uh, I'm on uh, Twitter at Tomas Puello without H T O M A S P U E Y O or uh, on uh, Substack at Uncharted Territories. Ben, where can we find you? Uh, where am I? I'm at Finn Morehouse on Twitter. Also, I have a website, finmorehouse.com, F I single M. And Martin, where can folks find your work? Uh, well, my Substack is brand new because I, I just uh, started it with this Roots of Progress uh, program. So there's only one post there. But I, uh, I'm i on Twitter as well. Uh, M. Boudry is uh, B-O-U-D-R-Y. Uh, and uh, I have a personal website as well. And uh, if I write anything it's I, I, in English, then it's uh, published in places like Quillette, uh, The Independent or Ario Magazine. But from now on, probably mostly on my uh, Substack. Amazing. Well, thank you, friends, for this conversation. It has been fantastic as we imagine a brighter future. And thanks for folks for listening and watching. And we'll be back next month with another conversation in our symposium. <laughs>